pray this morning that you would open our hearts, open our ears, oh God, to hear that one word that you have laid in store for us. For you are speaking, God, and we offer this word to you in humble obedience that you will do something beautiful out of it. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Thanksgiving. You seem all very stressed out. Is that Thanksgiving season does that for you? Maybe you are having people coming over and you're already sitting down and thinking, what is it that I need to cook? Is that right? Sometimes our minds are so all over the place. Uh, just hang in with me because I'm just going to go through the story with you and then I will be done. <clears throat> there are very few stories in scripture uh, that all of the four gospel writers say. Um, for, some, for simple things like um, there's one story that comes to my mind uh, right away. It's the story of uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And if you look at feeding of the 5,000, all of the four gospel writers say. Uh, but the thing that is about all of this is uh, they will kind of differ in some details. But the main idea will be the same. The main idea will be the same. They will be a little bit different. Um, for example, now when I say details, there is always a difference in details. Uh, for example, if you look at the birth stories of Jesus, Mark doesn't say anything. Come on, Mark, tell us how Jesus was born. And you know what he'll say? This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Hello, folks, say something more. Is that right? And if you go to John, John doesn't even open his mouth. He tells about, and the word was with the Lord, and it became, right? He kind of recreates the creation story for us. And only Luke and uh, Matthew say this. Is that right? Uh, I, and I kept thinking to myself, you know, even if when you go and read the resurrection story, the resurrection story is the most important thing, isn't it? It's the one story for, even if you, even if you have a hard time believing on the, the virgin birth, even if you have a hard time believing how Jesus was born, but there is one single story that is so important in all of scripture is the resurrection. But even when you read resurrection, Matthew will tell something, John will say something, everybody. So it kind of, they tell you the story, but they say something different. Now, why I say all of this is very simple. And, in the sense, and I kept asking myself this question, how come all the four gospel writers say this story? Because they saw something that was so important for the early church. They took that story, laid it on their memory, and they wanted to say the story. This is a simple analogy I'll give folks. Why do they tell that story? And sometimes it differs in details. Simple as this. In, in my first service, I used the, the, the analogy of cricket and uh, all of the young people are looking at me, like, what? <laughs> is that right? That's why I just had to reframe it and say, oh, I'm talking about baseball. They said, oh, there was a, a sigh of relief in their face. Simple as this. Look at the, look at the story, look at, look at cricket, how it's played. You know, the four people I just want to offer to you. The bowler, the batsman, the wicketkeeper and the fielder. Is that right? Uh, the, the, there is a ball and uh, the, the, the wicket is out. Now there are some people who will say, now if you ask the bowler, the bowler will say, I did one of the best, you know, I, I had this in-swing and that's it. The guy got, couldn't do anything, he was out. And then you ask the guy who batted and he'll say, no, 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 I went for the stroke, but guess what? It came through my legs. And then you ask the wicket keeper, the wicket keeper will say, no, 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 when I was there, I saw the guy when he left the ball in his hand and it came back and, you know, the, the third version. And if you ask the fielder, he will say something else, isn't it? Same out. Am I making sense? One guy getting out, but four people different ways. That's exactly what it happens in the four Gospels. All the four Gospels are saying the same thing, but slightly differently. So this morning I want, if you, if you get a chance, not now, if you get a chance when you go home, if you Google and say, anointed in Bethany, Jesus anointed at Bethany. If you go and Google it, all the four Gospel writers say the story. Which means there is something important, isn't it? D.L. Moody, the famous uh, preacher, who says, if all the four gospel writers say the same story, there should be something for them to do it. They wanted the early church to hear that story over and over again. So they say it in four different ways. And they say, so this morning I want to offer two of them, but the, let, let's look at the, the story from Luke chapter 7. If you have your Bible, just open it and I'm going to go through a couple of things. I'm not going to go through all of it. 
I just uh, saw a few things and I will offer that to you. Look at the first one. It says one of the Pharisees invited Jesus. Oftentimes we think to ourselves, oh Pharisees, the bad guys, is that right? They were the ones who gave them Jesus the hard time. No, 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 no. Pharisees are just a wonderful group of people. You know, if you, if you and I have the scripture today, it's because of the faithful way that they have held all of the church tradition and have passed it on to us. So Pharisees are not uh, bad people, folks. Pharisees are good people. He said, you and I can have a Pharisaical attitude. You and I can be ordinary people, but you and I can have Pharisaic attitude. The guys who were Pharisees looked at certain things and said, this is exactly how it needs to be done. And if you move from this side or the other side, you're wrong. That's what they did. Today, you and I have that Pharisaical attitude, is that right? We tell ourselves, this is exactly how we need to run the church. And somebody comes and tells us something, says, no, no, that doesn't work, brother, because that's how, because we have never done that way before. The six, the, the seven dying words of the church is, we've never done that way before. Isn't it? So Pharisees were good people. And that's why when Jesus gets invited, he wants to go there and spend that day. So Jesus goes into this whole house of a Pharisee and he went into the Pharisee's house and he took the place at the table. And then it says, and the woman, the second character in the story, and the woman, it says. Now, and the next line it says, who is a sinner? Now, I looked at this and I said, you know, whenever a woman, folks, and this is, this is what just got me. You know, when it says a woman and a sinner, the first thought it goes to our mind is she's a prostitute. Hello, where does it say? Doesn't say anywhere, isn't it? Luke even doesn't say that she was a prostitute. It just says, and the woman was a sinner. Today, we have party crashers, isn't it? Wedding crashers. Here is this, uh, it's a, it looked like a private party, and this woman crashes into the party. And you might, the next line it says, she comes into the house, and it says, she was having a a jar of an alabaster oil, it says. In other versions, if you go to Mark and Matthew, it says, it's a pure nard. Now, pure nard was, uh, was, a, was, a, was a perfume that came from the Himalayas, from India. Expensive. You just couldn't afford to have a pure nard. And here, this woman brings this alabaster jar of pure nard, it says, right? But then, only in Mark, you know, Mark, Mark says, when she brought that flask, she breaks it open. In this one, it doesn't even say it breaks it open. It says, probably she would have poured a little bit because it was an expensive perfume. But in Mark, you know what he says? She breaks it open. Once it's broken, guess what? You can't even pick it up, isn't it? That's how extravagant she wants to be. And so she comes and she breaks it open. And then she says, she came and stood behind Jesus. And I looked at that, uh, that part of scripture and said, this is just imagine for a minute with me. You are sitting at the table. Where is your feet? Where is your feet? Down. Down. Under the table, isn't it? Was she crawling under the table to get to Jesus' feet? Think about it. That's audacity, isn't it? For somebody to go crawling under the table to get to Jesus' feet. But then if you carefully read, probably that's not how it works. Probably the way they would do is they would lean on a table and they would put their feet out so that it is completely exposed. So that's how Jesus is sitting down and she comes and she breaks it open and then she washes her feet. And then she says, now the Pharisees who had invited them said to himself, Jesus that I worship, that you and I worship, is a mind reader, folks. You might sit down here. Sometimes I wonder, if you're sitting down here, and just imagine the Twitter goes on and on from your heads and what you're thinking about. A lot that's going on, is it right? And here is Jesus sitting down and says to himself, hey, this guy is thinking to himself, and Jesus knows exactly what he's thinking about. And that's what he says, Simon, what are you thinking about? And they say, if this man were a prophet, he said, he would have known and this, who this woman is and would not have touched her. And then it says, Jesus spoke up. This is the amazing quality of the God that we worship. When you are pushed to the corner, this God 
stands up for you. Amen. Amen. Speaks up for this woman. And then he says, since I have something to say to you, teacher. And then, uh, then he says this story to her. And he says, uh, Simon, I have something to say to you. Go ahead. And he says, a certain creditor and two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Jesus is talking about forgiveness and he's talking about debt. How do you match these two things, isn't it? Because in the Greek word that is used, that's why, you know, in, in the early church when they said, that, Our Father, forgive us our debts. Only in the later version it says, forgive us our sins. In the old original version, it's about debt. Somebody who carried so much debt. And here they say, this woman carried so much, this one debtor carried so much and the, the creditor forgave her. Let's keep going. Simon answered, I, I suppose that one who forgave the great one, right? And he said, you have judged rightly. This is the one that caught me. And then turning towards the woman, he was speaking to Simon. He's looking at here, but he's talking to you. This is what we call it as the overhearing of the gospel. I do this all the time at home. I want Roshni to hear something and I'll tell Rupak. <laughs> you do that too, is it? Rupak, don't do this. Roshni will get the message. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. What Jesus was doing is, he wanted to impress on Simon's heart. He looks at the woman and says this beautiful thing to her. He says, Simon, look at it. I came inside your house. You never gave me anything to wash my feet. Remember the story of uh, the, the story at the wedding at Cana? The six stone jars that were kept? It was for ceremonial cleaning. Right? He says, you did not wash my feet. You did not anoint me. You did not kiss. You did not nothing to me. And here is this woman who came inside, anointed me, did all of these things to me. You didn't do, do anything to me. And then the story ends. You know, it's a beautiful story. Now this is what I wanted to do. In the sense, I, I thought of this, looked at the story. And remember I told you, there's another place, the same story is told. In John chapter 11, you know this, you know the story, Mary, Martha and Lazarus. If there was one place that Jesus wanted to hang out, it was at the home of Mary and Martha. It was really a home. He could come there, take off his shoes, lie down there and have nothing to do. And here the, he, was, he was outside of the town and he hears that Lazarus is very sick. I know what he says. And then people send and said, Jesus, if you, if you will send a word, if you will come, if you will do this, my brother will be alive. And Jesus said, takes the time. He takes the time because he wanted to do something beautiful. So, Lazarus dies. Four days, Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus and cries out to the tomb and says, Lazarus, wake up. Remember I told you, it's all about the placement of the story, isn't it? When John tells that story, the same story. Now this time it's not a woman, but it's this time it's Mary, who's anointing the feet of Jesus. Now, why does John tell that story? Because there is something amazing that has happened in the life of Mary and Martha. Is that right? There is something phenomenal, folks, that has happened in the life of Mary and Martha. Look at your life and my life. You prayed very hard for this new job that you wanted. God gave it to you, isn't it? For the longest time, you prayed for this home. God gave it to you. You wanted this home. You prayed about it. God gave it to you. You prayed for your kids' admission to college. You said over and over again, God, I'm going to pray about this about my kids' college. God gave it to you. There's somebody at home who is sick. Day in and day out, you prayed for that person to be well. God did it. Isn't it? Now God did it and the response is very easy. Are you with me? 
very easy, isn't it? When you read John's story, much like us, God gives us, we are very happy. Thankfulness during that time comes very easily. Isn't it? But even then, in some instances, even when we have received these great things from God, guess what? Like the writer of Deuteronomy says, you know what? My hand has done this. That's what he says. There was a guy, there was a, there was a, a, a small aircraft that, uh, that met with an accident on Potomac River outside of Washington, D.C. It was a cold winter. About 10 people were drowning. The guy goes and saves, there's only one guy who knew, probably knew how to swim. He goes back and forth into the Potomac River, pulls out every one of them. And finally, you know, because he had exposed himself to cold, at the very end he had bronchitis and he died. Of all the 12 people he had saved, there was only one who came back and thanked him. The thing is, even when we have received what God has done in our lives, guess what? Sometimes it's hard to say thank you to God. Now, that's the setting in John's Gospel. Then you ask this question, what is Luke doing here, isn't it? Why is Luke placing it? Because when you look at the, the Gospel of Luke, it's right smack in the middle of Luke chapter 7. Because if you read Matthew and Mark, the woman anoints Jesus just before burial, just getting him ready. And then you ask yourself, why is Luke putting this story right in the middle of it? And that too, you know, after, it's not like she says thank you to Jesus after he forgives her sins. She does it before. Jesus has not even pronounced her as free and forgiven. She does that before. The reason why I am telling that all of those folks is sometimes God does things in our lives and it's, we are, it's easy for us to say thank you after we have received it. But here is God reminding us on Thanksgiving weekend, hey, begin to thank God even before God has done this in your life. See what God will do. I'm being very serious. Don't thank God after you have received are you struggling with something? Offer that to God. Are you wondering whether God will come through for you? Offer that to God. Thank God for what God is putting you through. And see what God will do in your life. Don't wait for God to do in your life. Offer that before. This is what I want to leave with you. There are a couple of things that I want to leave with you this morning. Is Thank God for the big stuff in your life. A lot of them. All of you sitting down here. You and I have stories uh, as immigrant parents, uh, as immigrant uh, people who have come into this land. You and I have gone through so much and God has done amazing things in our lives. Is that right? Thank God for the big things. But I want to also tell you, this whole year God has been reminding me not to thank Him for the big ones. God is reminding me to thank me for the small things. Let me give you a simple example. I usually study, I do my, I have a, a, a desk and my books are in the basement. I usually sit down in my basement and study. That's what I do. And there is a sump pump in my basement. And every two minutes, it will make that, it will make that nice. Sump pump. You know, when I do the, the first of the month morning service, I don't go to the basement because when I go to the basement, you will hear that noise. It annoys me all the time. Because here I will have a serious quiet time and my sump pump will go. This morning, God reminded me and said, hey, guess what? Thank God for the sump pump. Because if it doesn't work, you have flooded basement. You are finished. Amen? Folks, don't thank God for those big ones that God does in your life. That's easy. Thank for the small ones. I really thank God for the sample. Yeah. Seriously. And you know, the next thing that I wanted to offer with you is, you know, thank God for the big ones that He does in your life. But sometimes thank God even before that. 
This morning I stood here and even as I was preparing, I, I always think about my 9 o'clock service. Not many come. It breaks my heart every time. Because I want to see that, that uh, service pick up. That's where my heart is. I am speaking it from the bottom of my heart. That's where my heart is. Because if we don't get creative and do something for that generation of people, guess what? They will walk away. This morning I looked at them and said, God, I've been praying about this for a week after a week. Nothing is happening. You know what God said this morning? Thank me. Because guess what? It will grow. You know, it's easy, he told me, Kamlesh, it's easy, man, to thank you, to thank me when the church gets filled at 9 o'clock. Thank me when it's only a few, because I'm going to do something beautiful. So this is my humble offering to you this morning. Thank for the big ones, thank for the small ones. Thank for what God has already done, but thank Him for some things that He's yet to do. We pray with me. I don't, honestly, I don't know where you are in your life's journey. Maybe it's somebody in your home who is not well. Maybe it's, uh, maybe there's uh, this, a simple struggle that's going on in your office. Or maybe you're a college student sitting down here and uh, semester is not going so well for you. Uh, there is a, you are in an office situation that it's not the greatest. You've tried hard, you wanted to set this right, it's not working. It's easy folks to thank God when everything is doing well. God is reminding you and me, hey listen, say thank you to you for where you are. Because I will change, I will do something. I will do something amazing that your eyes will not be able to see it. Because I am not just a God of a big, I am also God of small things. I don't work with big people, I work with ardent listeners. I work with women who are being called sinners. I am that kind of a God. I know who you are. I know you through and through and yet I love you. And to that God I offer you. So offer whatever you are going through. Say thank you God for where I am. Because guess what? I am going to see your hand upon my life. Come at the end of the year, things will change. Because the God we believe is just not a God who only listens. He will work. He will do something beautiful in your life and my life. Just to offer those things to God and see what God can do. God, we thank you again for blessing this time together. We offer everything, O oh God, this morning. Our children, our lives, our jobs, our money, our everything, O oh God, to you. In humble thanksgiving for what you have done. And God, we want to offer, this morning we will come to the altar and we will offer it, not to meet something that's lacking in this church, but we will offer it in response to what you have done in our lives. To that God, we come to you and we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
good of all creation. For everything that you do in our lives, thanks be to God. And even in that hymn that you said, Lord, even while we are sleeping, while we are even not doing anything, yet your kingdom moves on. And God, to that God, we humbly bow. And we give you thanks. We send you from this place to wherever God will take you this week. May you bear witness to what God is doing in your life. And now may the peace of God, the love of Christ, the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.